Okay, right, well thanks again everyone for uh, attending. This is a um, concentrating solar panel, so it's going to be representatives from both uh, CSP, the solar thermal side of the business, uh, as well as two representatives from concentrating photovoltaics, CPV side of the business. So we actually have, um, we're going to have each of them kind of give a little quick intro to themselves, their background and their company, uh, and then we'll go ahead and have uh, sort of a moderated discussion allowing them to kind of defend some of the accusations that have been made against them during this conference this, this far, <laughs> and then uh, questions from the audience. Um, so without further uh, info, we're gonna have Amonex up first, actually. So Guy, you can basically. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. I'm Guy Blanchard, uh, VP of Corporate Development at Amonex. Uh, we have just a couple slides here because I'm not sure everyone here knows what CPV is. Uh, CPV is concentrated photovoltaics, not CSP, which was the concentrating world that everyone knew about with all the multi-hundred megawatt projects that have been out for so long. Uh, CPV has been around a long time as well. Uh, Aminix has uh, been around for over 20 years with 16 years of equipment history in the field. Uh, the company uh, has uh, built a product that works, but it never made any economic sense until the introduction of multi-junction cells, which brought the cell efficiency in these systems from about 26% to about 40% today. And that made Aminix and CPV as a technology, uh, not just viable, but a technology that's going to have a big uh, impact in hot and sunny areas, in high DNI areas, uh, which in the U.S. is the, the desert southwest primarily. So I just have a couple pictures of projects here, so uh, people that may not be familiar with this see that, that uh, the, the space is growing and has market acceptance, and uh, it's going to accelerate very quickly here over the coming years. Here is a five megawatt project owned and operated by Nextera Energy. It is currently the largest commissioned CPV plant in North America. And here is, uh, upon uh, completion in the first quarter of next year, it will be the largest CPV plant. This is a 30 megawatt plant in uh, Alamosa, Colorado, being uh, developed uh, by Cogentrix, owned and operated by Cogentrix as well, uh, built by Mortensen Construction, delivering energy under PPA to XL. So uh, that, that's about it for uh, introduction here. I look forward to having a lively conversation. Right. Actually, so we're going to switch the slides over to uh, Jayesh's slides for Arriva. And actually, one quick comment before you begin, Jayesh. Just so if you folks know, if you're looking at your program, we have had two substitutions on this panel, two upgrades, I would say. Uh, so we have, <laughs> instead of Mark Crowley from Soul Focus, we have Nancy Hartsock, who's the head of marketing. And uh, replacing Tom uh, Georges uh, from Solar Reserve, we have uh, Andrew Wang, who's the development director. So, sorry, Jayesh, go ahead. Okay. Thanks very much, Brett. So um, I'm from Arriva Solar. I look after the U.S. sales uh, for the uh, company. Uh, most of you may know Arriva from the nuclear side of our business. We also have a very large renewables business, which is over $3 billion right now, uh, mainly in offshore wind. And then last year, uh, through our acquisition uh, of Osra Arriva Solar, uh, our primary goals are to uh, deploy solar thermal technology uh, to serve customers' needs for thermal energy, steam, basically. Um, our headquarters are in Mountain View, and we also have manufacturing in Las Vegas and in Australia, where we have an operating plant uh, and operations teams there as well. And we have business development teams all over the world. Uh, this just gives a picture of some of the locations where we have teams around the world. Headquarters are in Paris. We also have an R&D facility there. Um, and of course, you know, the most of the headquarters staff, but sales teams, as you can see, are across the world. Um, just uh, giving you a couple of uh, our power plants, we have the Kimberlina power plant in Bakersfield, California, which was the first new solar thermal plant in California built in over 20 years. Uh, we demonstrated high pressure superheated steam there about two years ago. Um, so right now we are just making further advances to the technology. We also announced this year the Kogan Creek Solar Boost Project in Queensland, Australia. That's a 44 megawatt booster project, which will be online in 2013. So that's just some case studies and an introduction to Arriva Solar. Thanks. Okay, so I think now we're going to have Nancy give a few words about Soul Focus and yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Nancy Hartsock, the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development of Soul Focus, also for the uh, chairperson of an industry group called the CPV Consortium, which includes 95% of the CPV system cell and uh, supply chain partners, uh, Aminex and, and others are members of that organization. Uh, because as an organization, CPV has, has always been challenged in that it's promised a lot and delivered little. 
until really 2011. And uh, there's, been, there's been progress along the way, but this has really been the breakthrough year for the technology, both in deployments as well as in uh, a pipeline of projects. So Focus has been doing uh, CPV systems based on 3.5 high efficiency cells for six years now. Uh, we've got eight megawatts operating in the field, and uh, in most cases, a lot of those cases, four years of field data. So for us, it's a year where you can finally say, yes, commercial projects have operated. Yes, they're producing right at 100 or slightly better percent of their predicted energy generation, which kind of makes that bankability hurdle get better. So uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I would say for this audience that's here, you, you have a lot in common with CPV. Uh, CPVs has tenacity. <laughs> when people thought it was going to die and it was a zero billion dollar business, it survived. And, and like people that have been here for two days, you guys have tenacity because you're here for the last panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. And our last panelist, <laughs> Andrew, do you want to? You know, take a <clears throat> I've spoken on a lot of panels, but I've never been the guy to stand between, you know, this and Miller time. So <laughs> try to make this a good conversation. But my name is Andrew Wong. I'm the director of development for Solar Reserve. We're a Santa Monica-based company, a uh, developer of concentrating solar power plants. And you may have seen lots of pictures of uh, a project with a circular field of flat mirrors tracking the sun and a big tower in the middle called Solar 2. That was a project whose technology forms the basis for what we're trying to do. We're developing projects throughout the Southwest and in Spain using concentrating solar power. And just to give you a little bit of sense of the scale and what we're about, which is a little bit different from probably everything you've heard today and yesterday. There are um, it's a, a field of mirrors about 1.8 miles in diameter, and each mirror is 28 feet wide by 24 feet tall, and there are 17,350 of them, each pointing in different directions at a tower in the very middle. It's about a 653-foot tower. And on top of the tower is a device called a receiver through which we flow uh, it's a molten nitrate salt. And that salt is able to store the energy of the sun and not cool down very quickly at all. And then when you've got a, a source of heat in a tank and are able to boil water, generate steam day or night, then you're able to overcome some of the issues around renewable power in general, which is intermittency. When there's no sun, when there's no wind, typically with renewables, you get no power. Well, we can deliver power, uh, firm, dispatchable, predictable, um, and that's what we do. So we have a number of projects uh, permitted throughout the Southwest and in Spain, but just wanted to point out that there is one project that is under construction. It was fully financed with the uh, help of the Department of Energy uh, in September. It's called the Crescent Dune Solar Energy Project. It's about halfway between Las Vegas and uh, Reno in a little place called Tonopah, Nevada, a former silver mining town. And this project is 110 megawatts. So, you know, at this physical scale, it's not doesn't seem like it's much, but it's got a 50% capacity factor. So, half the hours of the year, day or night, it's operating. So, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more about what we do. Okay, thanks. So, I'm going to jump in with uh, the first question, which is maybe not a super nice question, but it seems like you know, for folks in the audience who don't follow this space super closely, you know, either CPV or CSP. <coughs> Uh, the announcement they might have heard about was that the world's largest solar project, uh, the 1,000 megawatt Blythe project, uh, was being developed here in California and uh, was going to use a technology called TROF, which is a type of solar thermal or CSP. And for some reason, or for various reasons, they decided that they would not, in fact, use concentrating solar and they will now be using PV. We actually had a panelist on a previous panel who said that TROF effectively is, is, uh, is on vacation. Uh, until further notice. And so I think for folks in this audience, might be like, oh, well, you know, so if this giant project, which is at scale, was using quote unquote concentrating solar, if they couldn't get it to work with a loan guarantee, that must mean the whole industry is kind of done, right? And the people who are sort of clinging on are just clinging on because they're stubborn or, you know, unwilling to take off the blinders. So, you know, I'll let each of you answer that question in turn. Like, why are you guys not trough or why are you not solar millennium and, and why, why do you still have a business model? <laughs> so Josh, sure, I'll go first. So <laughs> I almost feel like I'm dancing with my own f at my own funeral sometimes because <laughs> it's like uh, you know I keep hearing this story that uh, ah CSP is dying and oh why aren't you guys switching to uh, PV? <laughs> well, you know, for us it's like we're not. For us, we are seeing a very different marketplace. I mean, this year alone, we expect to end the year with 300 megawatts of signed contracts. This is for a company where we acquired the company last year. 
So I would certainly say that you know, we acquired a startup in the first year of operation having 300 megawatts of signed contracts. I don't mean PPAs, I mean actual signed contracts with construction about to start. We will end the year at 300. Next year, we are actually looking at, based on the Solar Dawn announcement that we won, we expect to announce next year about 550 megawatts of signed contracts. So at least for the next two years, I am certainly not feeling like, uh, you know, I have one foot in the grave. So now, given the context, so you look at the announcements that you are seeing about other solar thermal players and the challenges they are facing. I think part of it is in the U.S. market, certainly there have been some challenges in the standalone power market in particular with the PPA prices dropping. But around the world, there are many governments that are announcing CSP programs because they see the benefits of CSP, they see the value proposition. And there are programs in place for CSP which, again, in, with our technology and the costs we've been able to achieve, we've been very successful in Australia, in India, in other markets. Uh, we really believe we are a cost leader there. In the US, we haven't given up hope there either. I mean, yes, in the standalone market, there are some challenges right now, but we also have a very active booster market where we can provide steam to existing power plants. And we are able to provide steam at varying temperatures and pressures, and we can go right now all the way up to 450 degrees Celsius. And we are finding that in many cases, we can provide superheated steam directly to an existing coal plant or a combined cycle plant and help them boost their output. And that's a solution where we are able to actually meet pricing levels that are much lower than PD because you don't have to invest in the cost of the power block, right? So we are seeing prices, for example, prices, I don't mean costs, prices in the one and a half million a megawatt range with capacity factors still in the 18 to 20% range. So those solutions are extremely competitive today. We've spoken to many utilities and we already have been shortlisted for many of these projects. We will be announcing those as well. So I don't, I mean, I agree that Yes, U.S. standalone power market, short term, there are challenges until they see the value of CSP. But certainly the CSP business as a whole, we're seeing it as growing and thriving. So I really don't see any need for us to change our strategy of pursuing the technology we chose to pursue. Okay, why don't we actually have Andrew go next. We'll go with the two CSP guys and then we'll move to the sure. TV guys. There's no doubt um, our technology is uh, a premium priced technology but it's also a premium product. Now our, our, our challenge is that for RPS compliance, which in the US, that's what it's about, uh, the utilities, their utility commissions don't have authorization to buy premium products. It's all about complying with uh, RPS at the, at the minimum cost. And right now, PV is it. So, you know, our, uh, we have one project that, um, you know, the debt side, we've got a $737 million loan from the U.S. government secured by the PPA. We had to go out and seek um, a significant amount over upwards of $250 million in equity. So, you know, this is a close to a billion dollar project, and, but it is the first of its kind that can do what it is doing on a commercial scale. So, you know, our, our, uh, our challenge, a uh, significant challenge within our company is to innovate, uh, increase our efficiency, significantly reduce our costs in order to be, you know, in a place where we can, we can be in shooting range of, PP, uh, of uh, PV technology. So, you know, the U.S., I mean, we, we deal with uh, utilities throughout the Southwest where the economics work better for us. And, uh, you, know, let, you know, let's not even talk about renewable energy. So many of them don't even need any power for years, for the next few years. So that is a challenge for everybody in this room. So we're, we're, we're hanging on to our permitted projects. We're going to see them for. We have PPAs with uh, NV Energy, with, uh, with uh, PG&E. We have a project that was approved this year for the Spanish feed-in tariff, albeit a, uh, you know, a bit off the uh, original amount. And uh, we're going to expand into international markets. So I just say that uh, you know, we had our offsite, and we're looking to hire 20 people this year uh, you know, in, a, in a company of about 50 right now. So. Uh, Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Nancy, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, with, with what's happened, it, it always comes down to lowest cost of energy. You know, particularly with utilities, it's lower cost of energy, and, and driving new technology is critical, but it's challenging because nobody, want, nobody wants new technology, right? They want the tried and proven technology, but they want the advantages of new technology, which makes things a challenge. Um, you know, for CPV, this, this breakthrough year, I think a lot of what we see in the next two or three is because of the challenges that trough-based CSP are facing. You know, you can, you can deploy and you can get the benefits uh, and the efficiency benefits of concentrating with CPV, 
but you don't have to deploy at 150 or 250 megawatts. You can use 30, 50, 100 megawatt plants, put it near where you've got transmission capacity and distribution, or even distribution lines. So you can, you can fit often very well to where utilities need power. So it's really opened up an opportunity, but, uh, but there's always that challenge of new technology versus established, lower cost. And uh, I think what's hit a lot of the CSP plants is the unexpected cost of operation and actually cost over a lifetime of a plant, uh, as well as permitting challenges uh, based on how a lot of those plants are done. Okay. So uh, I think everyone realizes this, but Nancy and I have a fundamentally different product. Uh, we're not heating a, a, a material and then having a, a turning that into electricity in the second cycle. We have PV. It's PV, except it's concentrating. So uh, the performance of our systems looks like PV. We compete with PV. Our competition is PV. And for us to go win deals, uh, we have a, Concentrate has a lot of benefits, and we could talk about them, but if we can't beat on price, if we cannot win on price, we cannot win deals. And uh, the emergence of CPV is that it can win on price. We're not, we don't, we're not trying to sell a premium product. We're trying to sell the lowest cost product. Mm -hmm. And uh, the faster we can make that cost yet even lower, the faster that uh, we can uh, compete directly against uh, alternative new generation sources, uh, just uh, combined cycle gas, uh, other replacement sources of energy, then the market really opens up. So uh, we, we have a competitive product uh, as an industry today, and it gets more and more competitive every year. I think, mm -hmm. but, um, could I add one quick thing? Sure, go for it. <laughs> Thank <Make> you. Because <laughs> I think that's one of the things that CPV offers, and, and as, uh, as was said earlier, as Guy said, you know, the technology's been around a while. The economics started working when the cells hit 40% efficiency, and you could use less, less and less of that material. And, you know, that trajectory goes up. So the systems that are being sold today that are 28 to 29% efficient at the system level, you know, two years from now are 33% efficient. And, and that's what continues to drive that cost down. Okay. I just question. wanted to just come back to parabolic troughs. Yes, these, this is, you know, tried and true technology, bankable, financeable, all of that. But, you know, our view is that that's old school. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you have a situation where you're able to garner over 18 cents a kilowatt hour at a low elevation where you don't need, you know, excessive amounts of natural gas to keep hundreds of miles of thermal oil tubes uh, liquefied, okay, but that's not America. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, um, I did want to ask you a question. I noticed that uh, for those folks who were in Dallas at SPI, there was a booth. Um, by SunPower that actually had a, a new CPV concentrating photovoltaic uh, sort of sample. So obviously they're they're entering that space, um, and I think for for a lot of folks who sort of seem seem to be under the impression that like uh, VCs aren't interested in this anymore. You know everything seems to be just you know trying to come up with some little innovation like an ink you can sell to the Chinese manufacturers, like throw in the towel. It's too cheap. This seemed to be a, a different direction, right? That like. There is still some, some interest in, in coming up with innovative different solutions. And I guess, you know, sort of two connected questions, you know, do you feel like th th that, that is real positive for the CPV industry? And this, again, is for Nancy and Guy. But I guess, you know, m m more big picture, it, it seems like one of the biggest challenges facing, you know, both CSP and CPV is that, you know, yesterday we had uh, a representative from one of the bigger banks rank in order her uh, technologies of choice on bankability and uh, I'm not going to say who came in last, but it was CPV. And um, you know, I think you know, it was of a short list, but you know, I think one of the questions is, one way to get up on the bankability ranking is to have a company like Total in France commit a billion dollars or offer you their balance sheet. So is part of what needs to happen uh, for CPV to be successful is to do something like what uh, Osra did and get bought by Arriva or you know, partner with someone like a Total. So, Guy, do you want to start with that one? Sure. So uh, I think the path to uh, bankability uh, makes it seem like the product isn't bankable. And in fact, it is bankable. Uh, Amonix has investors such as NextEra that commit their capital to do this. Our uh, Alamosa project was fully underwritten. I had capital committed to it. And uh, you, know, that's, you, you add up projects, and it's a, it's a hunk of capital that's being invested into CPV right now. What CPV hasn't 
I believe that as an industry showing that is having uh, pure financial investors step up uh, and provide regular debt tax equity away from balance sheet IPPs. And uh, I, that will come. I think it will come much more, very, very quickly, much more quickly than, than maybe some people that might put CPV at the bottom would say, I mean, coming soon, I hope, uh, for all of us. But uh, I think the, it's just a progression. What we saw is uh, when we go out and market our product, we have this developer base, and the developer base says, well, show me the money. I need a financial exit. I need that investor. And it's made penetration there slower. Banks are slow. Well, banks don't like risk. And then we go to a uh, player like Nextera. Nextera is very confident, and they uh, can send their engineers out, uh, pour over our product, look at our roadmap, believe in the merits of the product, believe in the merits of CPV as a technology for them to grow with, and make an underwriting decision based on that. And I think, uh, answering your question more directly, the, uh, we need balance sheet, and the balance sheet can come, in our case, through warranties that we bring balance sheet, real balance sheet behind warranties that we provide. It can be by partnering with balance sheets in terms of EPC providers or even, uh, certainly in your examples, uh, equity owners as well. Uh, but uh, the, the, the balance sheet is important, uh, and, and the related balance sheet is having balance sheets step up and invest in the technology, and that's happening today. Okay, that's yeah, and, and you know, if I were the banking person that I didn't hear that yesterday, I would have said what's at the bottom in terms of the te these technology would have been CPV. Uh, because we are at the bottom of the list. I mean, we'd be kidding ourselves if we weren't. Uh, although I think there's other uh, new thin film, film technologies that would be right there with us or <laughs> perhaps lower. They sure. may have dropped recently. Um, you know, so there is a challenge there, and, and, and I agree complete with, with Guy in that, you know, we just saw in 2011 traditional PPAs, traditional debt and equity financing projects financed for ourselves, but they weren't financed out the gate for 100 megawatts. They weren't financed out the gate for 30 megawatts, but at 5 and 10 megawatts, yeah, financeable. And so, you know, I'd, I'd recently had one of our EPC partners, and we work closely with a number of them, one of those being Bechtel, saying, are you financeable for a 150 megawatt project today in traditional finance? And I said, no, I'm financeable for a 50 megawatt project today, but by the middle of next year, I'm financeable for a 150 megawatt project. And I think it's that pace at which the industry, you know, picks up. But again, uh, as Guy said, you know, partnering with EPCs, we partnered with Munich Re to underwrite our warranty uh, so that we could have somebody's balance sheet like Munich Re Insurance's balance sheet behind our power warranty. All those things are critical because, you, you know, it, people need, need assurance and you do everything you can to get there. Okay, great. Um, so we're actually going to jump now to a slightly different topic. So we're back to kind of energy storage. This is maybe a little more for Andrew and, and Solar Reserve. Um, so one of these things that's kind of come up, and I, I think I, I mentioned it in my previous panel when, I was, when we had the utilities up here, which is that, you know, PV sounds great, but realistically, what are you doing? You're putting it on the rooftop, you're generating when there's sun. It's not really uh, a direct replacement for a natural gas plant, right? And so a lot of people will say, you know, if the goal uh, of the industry is to go from being, you know, 0.1% of electricity generation to, you know, 50 or 60%, um, you're going to need something that looks and acts and feels like a natural gas plant in some ways, right? Because that's what the utilities are used to, and that, that's what you can flip the light switch on in this room and be certain that it'll work. The challenge is, is that right now, uh, penetration of solar in the U.S. is so low that putting a bunch of PV on the grid is not a problem at all. There's plenty of backup. There's plenty of peakers. And so to put this, you know, solar reserve plant online, it doesn't really have that much benefit. In a place like Crete or in a place like Hawaii, it makes a ton of sense. Um, and so there's, there's the possibility that the good solution is just early, and that maybe in 10 or 15 years, when we have high renewable penetration, then they'll really be clamoring for something like solar reserve, but you guys might not be around anymore because of sort of cash constraints. So <laughs> just curious, you know, are, are there ways to get you guys uh, to succeed in the near term in a place that has a lot of uh, spinning reserves, sort of natural gas plants online? Yeah, you know, for uh, if you look at the energy market as a as a hamburger, <clears throat> the energy and capacity portion of it is like the meat. Things like ancillary services, the regulations, spin up, spin down. That's like pickles, <laughs> like, you know, kind of um, kind of on the margin. So uh, you know, we recognize that our product is 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 a higher cost product. It generates uh, 
um, power more expensively. However, it does something that the other renewable technologies can't do. You know, and we have these two PPAs, one with uh, MB Energy. They were specifically concerned with the issue of, of uh, peak load in Las Vegas, in Nevada, but in Las Vegas, really, because that's where all the lights are. Uh, you know, extending into the nighttime. You know, this particular site where we interconnected had 180 megawatts of uh, capability with non-material upgrades. We were designing the plan for 180 megawatts and then in the PPA negotiation, they actually said, can you back down the megawatts and increase the hours of operation? Because for us, the thermal storage is just a big megawatt hour battery. You get more megawatts or you get more hours. We should, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll back it down to 110 and extend it such that there are, you know, on a summer solstice, it's like 16 or 18 hours of operation. So in the, in the PPA we had with uh, PG&E, you know, there are provisions, a little bit non-standard provisions that allow us to uh, be moved out of, out of peak and time of day and maybe start at 6 a.m. in the morning and then, you know, shut down and be, be uh, redispatched at other times of the day. So. The problem is, again, it comes back to the, the RPS compliance purchasing. And that is a, uh, a function that does not take into account, you know, grid of reliability, integration costs, and this kind of a premium aspect of firm and dispatching. So, you know, we have to, we have to carry the flag and, and move forward with PUCs around the United States to try to work in a way to uh, have that extra value realized. And so that's that's on our shoulders. And companies like RightSource, they're doing the same thing. East Solar, you hear them talking about molten salt energy storage. I think it's because there is this innate value that's not fully quantified yet, but is just, you know, on the operations side of the utility grid, they understand that you can't have things going on and off, you know, from minute to minute. Just, just one additional comment. I think while it's very important to recognize the benefits of storage in terms of being able to extend the hours of generation and so on, the, the other uh, real issue, the reason we are also working on storage in our solution is because you find that if you have a power block and you're going to have a fixed investment in that, you better be using that power block a lot more. Yeah. And so for us, the real question when we are looking at the storage solution is even in the US, even if the utilities don't value it as much, to get the overall cost of the project down and the cost of electricity down, we need to have storage so that we are fully utilizing that power block or at least using it much more. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is you need to incorporate storage, but only if it is really driving down your cost of electricity, not just because the utility will say, yes, I'm going to pay you more, you know, I mean, or just because the utility wants that extra hour of storage. They're not going to pay you more, much more for that extra two hours. It has to be at a lower cost or the same cost. Like most sense. of the storage discussion these days result revolves around things like batteries and flywheels, and uh, you know I venture to say that's not that's not quite there yet on a on a on a commercial basis or on a scale basis. But you know that's something that the grid needs, and I think this is you know there's a portfolio approach here that all of this stuff is needed. Now we just have to find where where it all goes. Sure. Okay. So the next question is actually more for folks in the center, CPV folks. So we actually heard a quote, I think, well, I guess it was Shea who sort of mentioned that we've been hearing numbers uh, for EPC cost, utility scale solar, I assume this is in 2012, of uh, $2 a watt all in. So that's the module, the inverter, BOS. Um, and I assume that is not pricing in 100% duty on the Chinese modules that will be coming into play. But you know, it's just a rough figure, let's say. Um, $2 a watt seems really cheap. And I get that CPV produces more power per watt installed. You know, it's not sort of a direct apples to apples comparison. But my guess is that none of the CPV guys are at $2 a watt installed unless they're um, accepting negative gross margins in, in a pretty substantial way. So the question would be, you know, if you're sitting down with a developer uh, a year ago, you know, you could say, well, look, you know, all in cost is 350 for PV. Go with us. We're about the same and we generate more power. My sense is that pricing has come down so much in the last year that it's hard, it's, it's hard to know exactly how that math works. But you know, my question would be is, do, do you feel that there are some utilities uh, that actually value the, the broad shoulders that you get? Uh, and for folks in the audience, maybe I should clarify that. The, essentially, the, the curve, the output that comes from something like CPV, because it has two axis tracking, has a lot more power early morning and late afternoon than uh, traditional uh, non-tracking PV. Do you feel like that's a selling point that you can really push? Or does CPV have to win 
on levelized cost or you're out. Well, I, uh, uh, projects have to win on IRR. Yeah. So that's a combination of levelized cost of energy and the value of the energy at different times a day. So yes, C CPV in a lot of utility areas is going to generate more high value energy, late afternoon hour energy than would a lot of other technologies. But, uh, you know, when we look at, and I totally agree, uh, you know, a year ago we would have been looking at deals and saying 350, no sweat, we can do that and we'll get more energy for that. You know, today could, could CPV, I can only speak for my CPV, could my CPV sell in 2012 for $2 a watt all in and make a 20% gross margin? You know, no. Um, but the utility projects that we're bidding right now are, are 2013 projects. So can you make a margin at that in 2000? Because most of the large scale 2012 projects are pretty well locked right now. I mean, if you're just now negotiating it, it's probably not gonna go in scale at 100 megawatts next year. So, uh, you know, so I think it's on the trajectory. I think one of the challenges for the industry is that you have two things playing for you. You know, to date, I mean, if we look at this year total, the CPV industry won't have grid connected, but will have probably manufactured about um, 50 to 60 megawatts of product, you know, which is tens of folds more than last year, but put that on the scale of what the PV guy's doing, it's very, very low volume. So we're on an extremely high trajectory of increases in volume, and it's a product which uh, benefits by economies of scale, just like the automotive industry or the disk drive industry, much more so than the PV industry. We've got a much steeper benefit from high volume. At the same time, our cell efficiencies are going up. So as an industry, we're trying to say, okay, how much do we bank on cell efficiencies going up? Because we don't have to change our products to take advantage of that. You don't have to change your manufacturing to take advantage of that. And how much are you gonna drive as you get to volume? So we're on a much steeper uh, cost reduction path than the others. So can we be under $2 a watt all in for 2013 projects and still make a profit? It, it'll be tight, but I believe that's probably doable. It won't be doable if the industry doesn't scale. You know, if we're stuck here at 100 megawatts as an industry, we won't be able to achieve that, but that's not what we're seeing. I mean, there's, what is it? I think it's using Brett's number, 600, 565 megawatts or something right. of, of announced projects. Doesn't mean they're all funded, doesn't mean they've all got PPAs, but they've got some kind of an agreement in place. So, you know, with that scale and stuff, you can get there. But again, we don't, I, I guess I look at it to say, I don't have to be at the same price because I generate more energy. Today I'm new technology, so I got a penalty for being new technology when it comes to financing. So in reality, to win just on cost, you really still have to be at the same price today. Okay, and Guy, do you want anything to that, or is that sufficient? I'll, I'll just add a little bit. Uh, we're, we're price takers. The shouldering's great. I think there's other good benefits. The utilities want some diversity. We have a lot higher U.S. content than other uh, products have, but all, and we have higher energy density. We have uh, the, the afternoon uh, hi higher energy staying in place, but it's, we are price takers, unfortunately. So when the market goes down, our margins erode, and we have to be that much better. But uh, we, we have projects going in in 2012. Uh, we have a lot more uh, plans for more in the future, and uh, the investment into CPV is because even in the most aggressive uh, PV cost roadmaps, CPV should be the winning technology in the markets where it works. In the desert southwest in the U.S., CPV should win. And uh, we, we expect between us and the other people here in the industry to, to demonstrate that over the coming years. Okay. Um, we don't have much time left, but I was going to see if there were any audience questions. If you do have one, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. And if you could announce your, your name and your company and maybe suggest who the question's for. Sure. My name is Adam Shore and I'm with EPRI. And this is for the CPV folks. What is the vetting process when it comes to deciding on the cell that you're going to use? And how often are you willing to change a cell if, it, if a, a new one comes to market that's more efficient than the one you've been using previously? So. You want to go first? Sure. So uh, one of the great benefits of CPV is it's got a wonderful roadmap ahead of us. Aminix product is going to have better cells, better use of the power that comes off that cells, all at, at continually lower costs. Uh, for us, uh, 
the goes to the balance sheet discussion a little bit. Uh, we, we, we want innovation and we have to get that innovation into our product, but at the same time our customers rely on the warranties that we're able to provide to get comfortable to invest capital. And uh, we have to have a product as a cell that's proven. Uh, the the 3-5 multi-junction cells are uh, adapted, trust realized from the space industry. They're very, very robust semiconductor devices. Uh, but we, we have to demonstrate that and we have to keep that in the product. So for us, it's trying to get the innovation into our product while keeping the bankability that having uh, a, a product that customers uh, understand uh, stays in as well. Uh, sure, but could you elaborate a little bit on the process required to, I understand that whatever new cell has to be bankable, but what goes into defining right. that for well, you well, all? Well, well, so certainly for us, we, we go through rigorous testing, uh, uh, at looking at extremes, looking at the life cycle testing, doing a battery of tests, and that's all well and good. That's the technical side. The reality of the business side, right now we're buying, uh, we, we take most of our cells from uh, Boeing Spectra Lab, and uh, customers are happy to see a Boeing name, any real warranty, attached to the product they buy. So there's the business reality that's separate from the technical side. On, on the technical side, though, if I, I'll just touch on that briefly, because, uh, you know, we, we keep, there's probably 15 people making cells today. You got the, the Boeings, the MCORs have done it for a long time. You got the Solar Junctions and the Cerium doing new advanced things. And then you've got people like JDSU and, and RF Digital and those guys who are just big semiconductor guys that are doing LEDs and things that say hey, it's the same process. So, so you have it, and, and this industry has never had this before. They've never had, which it's, to, to me it's extremely exciting because, you know, as long as you have a, a, a stale, stale cell base, you don't, pace, you don't push the stable guys to push the edge, right? No competition, then you just kind of stay there. So it's exciting, so, but we have a pretty rigorous, we, we, we track all these guys, we select the five that we think are the most important, which usually includes two established and three innovators. Um, we have programs with them where as we do modules, their cells go in our modules. Uh, today we've got our products certified with three different, IEC certified with three different cell suppliers. And we think that's important because of scalability, um, you know, as well as keeping pace with the technology and, and not necessarily being locked in just to one cell supplier. So, but it's a pretty rigorous, we have, we have, you know, five people doing nothing more than cell testing and reliability testing on those cells. Okay, well thanks. Actually, um, it looks like we're out of time. So we're actually gonna have Scott uh, Clavena come up and say uh, one or two quick words, but if you wanna quickly thank our panel for, for their time, we really appreciate it. And you guys just want to remain seated for one second. All right, well, thanks. I just want to, I'm Scott Clavano, CEO of Green Tech Media. I just wanted to close the conference. Thank you all for attending. I've had a great experience the last two days, and I hope you did too. Um, you will get presentations by email uh, within the next few days, so uh, look for those. And I also just wanted to say we're, we're, this is our first year of this conference, and I think it was a success, so we're going to do it again next year, uh, probably same time. Uh, in San Francisco. And so in the meantime, please uh, give us any feedback on the conference, how to make it better for next year, and um, any ways that we can improve uh, your experience and the, and the content we bring. And also, uh, just wanted to remind you, you've met the analysts, you've seen uh, and heard from them, and got to know their expertise, so reach out to them uh, with questions or any uh, comments or your thoughts on the industry. They're available. Uh, they're all at analysts at gtmresearch.com, or if you've met them personally, um, start a relationship there. They're definitely a great group of uh, analysts and they're going to be tracking this U.S. solar market in great detail over the next year. So again, safe travels. Thanks for attending and I uh, hope to see you next year. Good.